Like, in fact, I'll end up holding the mic. Okay, the, the topic for my talk tonight is free speech and hate speech. Welcome to the thought crime of 1984. As some of you may be aware, I'd originally proposed to talk tonight about the topic of the church as a hospital. The focus of that talk would have been on the healing and cleansing of the soul. I proposed to Tom changing the topic after the Drawing Muhammad contest in Garland, Texas, back in April, I think it was, and the thwarted terrorist attack there. What prompted me to change topics was the way the Garland event was spun in the media from both the left and the right. And as I began thinking more of that response and saw it in the broader context of the Constitution, freedom of speech, so-called hate speech, and I'll throw in some ad-libbing here, campus speech codes, um, which I think are extremely dangerous. In the moves to limit speech, it became clear to me that this topic is much more pressing than the church's hospital. Our country is sick, folks. It has a disease, one that is spreading throughout society, and if we don't put a stop to it, it will soon erode and destroy the very foundations upon which this country was founded. The disease doesn't have a single name, though I'm sure some of you would be willing to offer one. But it's the child of political correctness, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. It takes many forms and has many symptoms. For example, we see it when a Christian baker is labeled as homophobic because she won't cater a homosexual wedding. We see it when a white Republican is labeled as racist because he opposes President Obama. We see it when a college professor is investigated because she dares question the rape hysteria on college campuses. Notice I intentionally said she because I have a liberal feminist professor in mind who had this happen to her. We see it when scientists lose their positions because they doubt anthropogenic global warming. In each of these situations, an individual has violated a tenet of what Kirsten Powers in her book, The Silencing, calls the illiberal left, and the illiberal left attempts to silence and destroy them. In each instance, an individual is operating on the assumption that the First Amendment to the Constitution is still in effect. But in each instance, while our society pays lip service to the Bill of Rights, it is abundantly clear that the individual has crossed the line. He or she has engaged in what George Orwell presciently called a thought crime. These people have entertained and expressed thoughts which are not allowed. These are thoughts which the illiberal left has deemed out of bounds, thoughts which are not thinkable or permissible. Thus, these are thoughts which cannot be debated or argued. They must not even be heard or expressed. So how did we arrive here? And what is the Christian to do about it? To answer those questions, I think, we must begin at the beginning, not at the fall in the Garden of Eden, though we could begin there, because that's where ultimately all these problems begin. No, we need to go back to the beginning of the United States. Our current freedom of the press and freedom of speech may be traced back, obviously, to the colonial period. But let's go even farther back than the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, to 1733, to be exact. In that year, a German immigrant named John Peter Zinger was jailed for seditious libel for publishing, not writing, publishing articles critical of the governor of New York, William S. Cosby. At the time, seditious libel, libel excuse me, meant only that he published something against the government. It's all that it was. Okay. Any statement that went contrary to what the government or governor or minister of the government said. The case went to trial in 1735. All the government needed to prove for seditious libel was that Zinger had in fact published the articles. During the trial, during the first phase of the trial, his wife kept printing the paper that he was publisher of, called the New York Weekly Journal. The first jury 
was filled with individuals on the governor's payroll. She pointed this out repeatedly in articles. Because of that, the jury was replaced and was seated by a jury of peers of Zinger. The U.S. History website writes that, quote, the most famous lawyer in the colonies, a Scotsman, Andrew Hamilton of Philadelphia, stepped up to defend Zinger. Hamilton admitted that Zinger printed the charges. Keep in mind, all the government needed to do was prove he had, in fact, printed them. His lawyer stepped up and admitted that fact. But he didn't stop there. He demanded the prosecution prove them false. In a stirring appeal to the journey, Hamilton pleaded for his new client's release. Hamilton, I'm quoting, it is not the cause of one poor printer, but the cause of liberty. This is 1735. Continuing the quote from the U.S. History website. The, George, excuse me, the judge ordered the jury to convict Zinger if they believed he printed the stories. Okay, bear in mind, what did his lawyer already say? He printed them. The jury returned in less than 10 minutes with a, with a verdict of not guilty. Okay. Half a century later, the governor of New York, who served on the committee of five responsible for drafting the final version of the Constitution, claimed the trial of Zinger in 1735 was the germ of American freedom, the morning star of that liberty which subsequently revolutionized America. Okay, this is one of the final drafters of the Constitution laying the seed for liberty at that event in 1735. As we all know, I hope, the First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. There was much debate regarding whether the Constitution needed to include the Bill of Rights, but we don't have time to go into that tonight. If you're interested, read the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Suffice it to say, James Madison, one of the framers, in fact, the primary framer of the Constitution, who was initially against the idea of a Bill of Rights, yet is primarily responsible for the Bill of Rights that we have. He originally submitted, if memory serves, a bill, I think it was, of 19 rights, which later got pared down to 10, uh, 12, and then down to 10. Note that the First Amendment refers to, quote, freedom of speech, end quote, of the press. Initially, those ref terms referred not to all speech, but speech directed at, one, members of the government, two, public policy and actions of the government, and three, the government itself. That is, freedom of speech did not refer to my standing up on a soapbox and saying whatever I pleased, originally. It referred to speech directed at some kind of public interest. Okay? The First Amendment was deemed to be necessary so that citizens could criticize without fear of arrest or censorship the government, the bureaucrats therein, and the actions and policies of the government and its ministers. Thus, from the founding, freedom of speech and of the press referred to speech and publication about public affairs and policies, government, and the people therein. But even with that clear language, just 10 years after the ratification of the Constitution, President John Adams signed into law the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, which did what? Made illegal certain speech that was critical of the government. That is, freedom of speech, freedom of press was designed specifically to enable one to be publicly critical of the government. Adams signed into law 
a law that curtailed that ability. Right? Sounds similar or familiar to what happened to Zinger? Supreme Court never had to rule on the Sedition Act, right? which expired in 1800. Okay? Thomas Jefferson was elected president in 1800. Jefferson and Madison were both vehemently against the Sedition Act. Okay. Let's jump forward about 120 years, specifically 1918, and the new Sedition Act. Okay. The Sedition Act of 1918 followed on the Espionage Act of 1917, issued fairly soon after the United States entered World War I. What did the Sedition Act of 1918 do? According to Wikipedia, which I know as a professor, you know, you're not supposed to trust, but <laughs> frankly, most of my research where I've used Wikipedia is pretty accurate, be that as may. Quote, the use of disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the United States government, its flag, or its armed forces, or that caused others to view the American government or its institutions with contempt. Those convicted under the act generally received sentences of imprisonment for five to 20 years. So if you spoke disloyally about the government, if you derided the flag, okay, this is what could happen to you, a sentence of five to 20 years. Carl Rogers, in his book, I didn't include it in the text, Debunking Glenn Beck. In his book, Debunking Glenn Beck, has written that President Wilson, quote, misused the 1918 Sedition Act to silence and imprison anti-war protesters, anarchists, socialists, suffragettes, and pacifists. Eugene Debs, leader of the Socialist Party, ran for president on the Socialist Party, I think, five times, five times was sentenced to 10 years in prison for, quote, obstructing recruiting, unquote, by making an anti-war speech. Okay, just let that perk for a while. Sentenced to 10 years for making an anti-war speech. Rogers goes on to discuss others that Wilson had imprisoned for harming the U.S. war effort in 1918. And I won't go into the detail. I mean, it's, you know, um, some of the leaders of the suffragettes movement, if you've ever seen the movie, I knew that would happen, early onset Alzheimer's. Um, it's about the suffragette movement. It's, you know, all these women who get thrown into prison for their actions against um, the Sedition Act, essentially. Congress repealed the Sedition Act in 1920. Now, remember, the first Sedition Act ex expired by how the law was written in 1800. This one, Congress repealed in 1920. The Espionage Act of 1917 still remains in place and in force and has been used very recently okay, by the government. It was most recently used, in whatever your opinions of this individual, against Edward Snowden. <coughs> it was also used against James Rosen of Fox News okay, for an article that, or a presentation um, that he did on the newscast. In fact, CNN's Jake Tapper, I personally think is one of the reliable voices in the media, still liberal, but he's reliable, has said that President Obama has used the Espionage Act against government whistleblowers more than all previous presidents combined. That's from Wilson up to Obama. Right? You can look that up on PolitiFact, by the way. Okay. Note how with the Zanger case and the Sedition Act cases, speakers were jailed for speaking out against either perceived wrongs of the government or government individuals. Zanger against Cosby. He said he essentially was a crook. Or against government policies. Debs against the war. They spoke against what they perceived were injustices of the state. Zanger was acquitted. He didn't have the Constitution to rely on either. Debs was sentenced to 10 years, which President Harding commuted in December 1921 to time served. 
Winston Smith received no such mercy. Winston Smith is the protagonist of George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, first published in 1949, written largely in 1948. If you haven't read 1984, you need to. <laughs> if for no other reason, it's a roadmap of where we're headed to. Okay? Along with, I would add, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Three novels, by the way, which get very, this is completely off my text, which get very little play on university campuses, especially Bradbury's. And that's because Bradbury's is the shortest of the three, but it is by far the most direct. It is by far the most clear about how totalitarianism ultimately arrives and how free speech gets killed. And according to Bradbury, it's not from the top down. It's not from the government down. And as we'll see the rest of my talk, that's true today, too. In 1984, Orwell coined the term thought crime to describe thoughts against the state. Thought crimes were, were ultimately impossible to conceal. And here's what's happened once they were discovered. Quote, it was always at night. The arrests invariably happened at night. The sudden jerk out of sleep, the rough hand shaking your shoulder, the lights glaring in your eyes, the ring of hard faces round the bed, in the vast majority of cases, there was no trial, no report of the arrest. Your name was removed from the registers. Every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out. Your one-time existence was denied and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized was the usual word. Thought crime, the very term thought crime, comes from another one of Orwell's creations, new speak, which is the new form of language, the language being created in the novel. The point of new speak is to narrow the range of thought. Quote, in the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point. He's referring to the 11th edition of the Dictionary of Newspeak in the novel. But the process will still be continuing long after you and I are dead. Every year, fewer and fewer words in the range of consciousness always a little smaller. pause for a moment and think of how words have shifted in meaning just in your lifetimes. And how in many of those instances, the shift in meaning is not a, a diametrically opposed shift in meaning, but a narrowing of meaning. So that whereas a word may have once had a multiplicity of meanings, now it has a much narrower range. Do you start to see why this novel is so important? With Newspeak, language is consciously altered so words no longer mean anything. So we could jump to almost the end of my paper and let's talk about gay marriage. But we won't. Early on in the novel, we read the three mottos. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Each motto is an aspect of doublethink, a core tenet of Newspeak. Here's how Orwell describes doublethink. His mind slid into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory 
in believing in both of them. To use logic against logic. To repudiate morality while laying claim to it. Man, it's eerie how prescient he was. To believe that democracy was impossible and the party was the guardian of democracy. To forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. And above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety. Consciously to induce unconsciousness, and then once again to become unconscious of the fact of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. You see, in the novel, Winston's job is to rewrite the past. He works at a place, or, or at a cubicle, in what's called Minitru, the Ministry of Truth, whose sole job is to produce lies. He works at a position where it is his job to change history. Whereas in the war against between Oceania and Eurasia, let's say. Yesterday there had been a battle and a certain number of troops were killed. And that news was broadcast or published, let's say. But today, Oceania, the world that the novel is set in, or the society the novel is set in, says that that battle never occurred. So it is his job now to go through all the official documents retrieve those non-truths and put them down the memory hole. You've probably seen that phrase, memory hole, because it's used on the internet an awful lot. Because of people who will post something and then think, oh, I can delete that, and then delete it, not realizing that there are web engines, I guess you would call them, whose sole purpose is to archive everything. It's on the net. It's his job to delete the past, to delete down the memory hole those facts and tidbits of truth that no longer correlate with state propaganda. Because he knows he's rewriting the past, that he's changing history, Winston Smith is troubled and disturbed by the new truths. Yet the purpose of doublethink is to cause him to know that what he's removing from the past never really happened, and to know that what he's changed the past to has always been true. That's doublethink. What Orwell is talking about in 1984 is the blurring of the public and the private. In fact, it's the obliteration of the private. The eradication of private thoughts. The state is all and in all things. Without the state, nothing exists, and nothing existed before the state. One cannot have thoughts not allowed by the state, because to do so is to deny the supremacy of the state. And those who have such thoughts must be silenced, removed, destroyed. So where does that leave us today in 2015? What are the thought crimes of today? The idea is not deemed appropriate by the state and its followers. The adherence of the state. I wrote here, obviously we aren't yet to the point of literal thought crimes, but that's not true. We are. And the first example I'm going to use is the example par excellence. April 2014. Donald Sterling, ring any bells? Anybody know what this is about? 81-year-old yeah. owner of the NBA team, the LA Clippers, was recorded in a private conversation as saying he didn't want his 31-year-old girlfriend, who is of Hispanic and black descent, to bring or post photographs of herself and black people to her Instagram account or to bring black people to Clippers games. Okay? Private conversation between two individuals. When the recording was made public, all hell broke loose. 
The news media were awash in stories about Sterling's racism, about his crime. What happened? Anybody remember? You made two billion dollars. Okay, <laughs> it's one way of looking at it. He was strong armed into selling his team he didn't want to sell. NBA fined Sterling for a private comment to a mistress nearly three million dollars. And, and I, I don't even think that's the bad part. <laughs> Banned him for life from any NBA activity. Didn't they also ban him from the venues themselves? Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. He was still the owner of the LA Clippers. He could not attend an LA Clippers game. He could not be involved in the running, the management of the business. Thought crime? Did he violate anybody? Did he actually, in this instance, okay, I'm only looking at this one, discriminate against anybody? No, he didn't. So, didn't he damage the brand? Not a government action. That's possible. <clears throat> if you're going to say that he <clears throat> is the brand. I mean, are, you, are we then going to take any representative of anything and say, and, and paint the entire group with that brush? Okay, the devil's advocate. Hold on a minute. Oh, oh, Mark. Let, me, let me finish and we'll come back to questions. <laughs> Hold on, Mark. Can I, can I have a microphone? Or go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think you have very valid points with devil's advocate. Was the state... No, I agree. Now, now, he did have property rights taken away. I agree. And certainly the connivance of the state was there with it, but it wasn't a violation of the First Amendment. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is an instance where the state came down on it. Can I ask a question? Sure. I would say that he probably did express some racist thoughts. So oh. my question to you was, but you would be saying it doesn't really matter. No, I, I would be the first one in line to say he was a racist. Yeah. But I would be the first one in the other line to say racist thoughts aren't banned by the Constitution. Correct. Period. Okay, and we're going to get to that point a little bit later on. But wasn't the NBA fundamentally just defending its brand? No. No. Yeah. If the people, if the if the culture in the United States was going to was going to say, well, gosh, the L.A. Clippers owner is a racist, so I'm not going to go to L.A. Clippers games. The NBA would would stand to lose a lot of money. Okay, but still, over what? But you see, it was. It's thought. Yeah. It's thought that's being. This is this is I think the point. It's thought that is being banned. It's. But, Thought they, they that's were, being punished. They were in a position. They were in a position to call those shots because of the contractual relationship sure. between those people, not not the government. So, for a private comment to a mistress, he was forced out of his business, and I mean, I have to admit, he became a national pariah. Well, the takeaway is you can't trust your mistress. Well, it's, <laughs> and if you can't trust your mistress, I mean. <laughs> what, what's the world so, <laughs> notice what happened. Who can you trust? <laughs> his thoughts, his speech, crossed the line of acceptability and were deemed hate speech. Okay? So, what's hate speech? Who's going to define it? Are we going to let nine guys and, and women in robes, black robes? Are we going to let the European Union, because they've attempted to, according to the American Bar Association's Students in Action website, quote, hate speech is speech that offends, threatens, or insults groups based on race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, or other traits. Okay. 
Think about that. It offends. Repeat. Repeat it. Hate speech is speech that offends, threatens, or insults groups based on race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, or other traits. Yes? What does that say about satire? Uh, because I'm a huge fan of South Park. I mean, that's the best example of satire out there. Depends on who's being satirized. Well, largely it does depend on whose ox is being gored. <laughs> and it depends on who's doing the goring. But the only cartoon that's been obliterated in South Park is the one that had Muhammad's picture in it. That one is not published in any of the discs of South Park. I'm and not they, a South Park fan, so I don't... They have fought to get that put into the DVDs. I mean, they had one, though. Yeah. Try to buy a copy of... Um, yeah, I was going to say, they, Song of the South. They, they didn't even show them. They showed, no, no, they, they, they showed did. A, a locked van with him in a bear suit. No, 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 no. In one episode, they did with the religious super friends of Muhammad, which you shoot, could shoot fire out of his hands. Okay, when are they going to do the Book of the Quran rather than the Book of Mormon? <laughs> oh, they would do it. Uh, trust me, they would do it if somebody would fund them. Okay, here's another. Here's another example. <laughs> According to the Learning from a Legacy of Hate, a site about the KKK, okay, at Ball State University. This is a long quote, so bear with me. Hate speech consists of verbal and nonverbal expression that is used to demean, oppress, or promote violence against someone on the basis of their membership in a social or ethnic group. Hate speech involves more than simply indicating that you dislike someone. It also is different than simply teasing or ridiculing someone or shouting an ugly word at them in a single moment of anger or frustration. In many cases, hate speech is created by people who are part of majority population. Their messages typically are directed toward people who are part of a minority population. The targets of hate speech are chosen just because they belong to that particular group of people. The messages of hate also are designed to degrade or otherwise harm these targets for the same reason. What are some examples of hate speech? Racist cartoons. Song of the South, Little Black Sambo. Anti-Semitic symbols spray-painted on the side of a synagogue. What if they're not on the side of a synagogue but somewhere else? Does that mean they're no longer hate speech? Ethnic slurs or other derogatory labels for a group. Burning a cross in the yard of an ethnic minority. Politically incorrect jokes that target the disabled or the aged. Sexist statements. Anti-gay protest signs and chants. Okay, that's all quoted from the website. So, you go to the Oscars and you're a quote-unquote Bible-believing Christian, and you hold up a sign that says homosexuality is a sin. That is an anti-gay protest sign, right? That's hate speech. Note how fluid and open these definitions are. In some countries, England, for example, and I love England. I go to England just to London just about every other summer to teach a course. Any statement that can be construed as hate speech will be. This is the most asinine example. This, this, if you've never heard about this, will blow your mind. In 2006, an Oxford student was arrested by the Oxfordshire police for asking a mounted policeman, a policeman on his horse, this isn't San Francisco. Excuse me, do you realize your horse is gay? He was arrested. He was arrested under Section 5 of the Public Order Act for making homophobic comments. The lad was, the lad was drunk, or at least he'd been drinking. 
Why? Because he'd been celebrating the completion of his year's work. That ended up not going to trial. The prosecution essentially said, are you kidding? But just because it didn't go to trial doesn't mean there was no harm done. In the last year and a half, two years, there have been, I could go through my computer and pull them all up, there have been about a dozen cases of people who have been arrested for comments made on Twitter, Facebook, photos posted on Instagram, etc., okay, where somebody has said something, quote-unquote, derogatory towards another individual or another class or race of people. A couple of years ago, when the, um, when the British paratrooper was murdered in Brixton, South London, a couple of Islamic jihadists came out, hacked him up with a machete, etc., and then taunted people until they were arrested. Two individuals posted on Twitter statements about Islamic whack jobs and were arrested for Islamophobic comments. All too often, especially in Europe, but increasingly so in the United States, the term hate speech is used to cudgel into submission those with whom the left disagrees. Racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, they're all terms used by the left to disqualify something as hate speech. And it's disqualified so that it doesn't have to be addressed. It doesn't have to be debated. Okay? Last year, when Ferguson, Missouri police officer Darren Wilson shot and killed Michael Brown, immediately the cry arose of racism. Anyone who defended Officer Wilson was labeled a racist. Anyone who doubted, hands up, don't shoot, was labeled a racist. Even after the grand jury returned no indictment and concluded that Mr. Brown had attempted to take Wilson's weapon and was charging toward him when he was shot, still the cries of racism were heard. Similarly, any time, any time, an African-American is shot by a white officer, the national media go berserk and cry racism or institutional racism and let loose the dogs of war. But when a black officer shoots a white person, no such cry is heard. I think it is the very same week that Michael Brown was shot, in Salt Lake City, a black officer shot a white suspect, shot and killed. That incident did not make any of the national news. It was on some conservative websites and, and prompted and promoted. Similarly, when a black officer shoots a black person, there's no comment made. Nor when a black person shoots another black person. See, racism works one direction only. It can only, according to the left, be perpetrated by whites against blacks. Why? Because whites are in the majority and blacks are in the minority. Okay? Never mind the facts. So when a group of black youths attack a young white man outside a movie theater, it cannot be racism, nor racially motivated. It happened a few years ago, several years ago, outside a theater showing the film Mississippi Burning. The white kid had just walked out of the theater, and these black kids were walking down the street. They saw the marquee. They knew what the movie was about, and they said, let's get him. And it wasn't deemed a quote-unquote hate crime. Or as happened recently in Baltimore, if a group of black youths destroy white <coughs> businesses, that's not racism. What did the mayor of Baltimore call that? Protest. Similarly, to say that American public policy regarding public housing and welfare for the past 50 years is demeaning to black Americans and destructive of the black family, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan first pointed out in 1965, 
just as Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program was getting off the ground, okay, Moynihan pointed out, liberal senator from New York, Moynihan pointed out okay, that the policies the American government had already been following are destroying the black family. And what happens to him? He is raked over the coals and hung out to dry. I mean, just obliterated. Anything, that calls into question the left's assertion that the United States is fundamentally racist will not be tolerated. Such speech will be deemed hate speech. Why? Because it targets all black Americans. In fact, in some places, just to use the term black Americans may be seen as hate speech because it denies their country of origin and thus the right to be called what one wants. Speaking of which, what do you think about Bruce or uh, Caitlyn Jenner? Have you noticed how quickly the media came to support this person? I can't call Jenner her, because <laughs> biologically, he's not. Jenner's mother-in-law in the 1970s was my middle school counselor. I mean, I have as probably most of you do, those very clear memories of the 76 Olympics. Did you similarly notice how quickly anyone who spoke against what he's doing was labeled a sexist or homophobic? It doesn't really apply, but it was still used. Note well what's happening. Anyone in anything that is LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, or any of the other, what is it Facebook is up to now, 50 different definitions for gender? Double thing, folks. <laughs> anyone who, anyone in anything that is LGBT is currently fashionable, morally upright, and worthy of support. Anyone who disagrees with the LGBT movement is a sexist, homophobic, troglodyte, moron, and must be silenced. There can be no discussion. When Jenner was awarded an ESPN award for heroism, Courage? Was it courage? I thought it was heroism. Okay. A variety, I'm pretty sure it was heroism. You don't have to ask courage award. Okay. A variety of people spoke up and complained. I mean, first of all, for those of you who remember Arthur Ashe, just to put Jenner in the same league as Arthur Ashe is, I would say, a thought crime almost. When did that uh, happen? Last week. Well, did, you, did you see what happened to uh, Clint Eastwood? Yes, I did. Clint, yeah. Well, maybe I'll throw that in. One person who spoke out against this was Connor Cruz, Tom Cruise's son. He spoke out against it, and he was roundly vilified by the left. If I remember to the point that he issued an apology. All he did was suggest that perhaps there were others who were more deserving of an award for courage. Think of the numbers of troops we've had in wars in the last two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. I mean, how heroic is it, after all, to do what Jenner has done? He says he's had these feelings for decades. Yet he only makes the change when. See, this is me here. I'm not ascribing this to anybody else. Seemingly when it's financially worthwhile for him to do so. After all, what's he getting? He's getting his own reality show out of this. I don't know what they're going to call it. Is it going to be keeping up with the Jenners? Is that Jenner plural as in Bruce and Caitlin? Or is it Jenner... I, I have no idea what to make of that. See that little... Keeping up with the genders, yeah. Jenners. Gen okay. Bruce and Caitlin together. Okay. Or genders. We can't keep up with that anymore. <laughs> Not a Facebook saying there's 50 of them. But even, you know, that, that little comment, keeping up with the Jenners and suggesting that it's plural, that would be an example of hate speech to some. Because I've made light of the entire transgendered movement. <clears throat> but so is Jenner, in my opinion. He said that while he 
appears as a woman. He's had the plastic surgery. He's had the breast implants. He has the dresses and the hair and all that. He's still heterosexual. He's not sure yet whether or not he's going to go through with gender reassignment surgery. In other words, he still has male parts. And he has said he is still, as a male, attracted to women. He's not yet attracted to men. Okay. In his interview with Diane Sawyer, Jenner claimed that God was in a jovial mood when he was created. He said that God put the soul of a woman in the body of a man and essentially told him, work it out. Really? <laughs> Is that jovial? Is that God's action meant as a joke? Wouldn't that make God more of a monster? Or perhaps Jenner is just confused about many things. And perhaps are most of those who suffer transgenderism similarly confused? Or, as Paul McHugh, psychiatrist-in-chief at Johns Hopkins Hospital, put it in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in July of 2014, okay, Johns Hopkins Hospital, performed the first gender reassignment surgery in the 60s and led the way, which, by the way, has ceased doing gender reassignment surgery. McHugh wrote in an op-ed that transgender people are mentally disturbed. And Johns Hopkins has ceased transgender reassignment surgery because it considers it to be a mental disorder. So perhaps what is needed is, yes, understanding, but not capitulation to and celebration of this disorder. To the point, if, if you've kept track of this at all in the news over the last couple of years, to the point where now parents are encouraged if a six-year-old boy shows interest in wearing his sister's clothing, that maybe the parents need to encourage that child to identify as a girl. Rather than maybe seeing that the child is engaged in make-believe, dress up. Perhaps counseling and therapy are what is needed. But that would deny what the transgendered are. And that's hateful. And so it goes. So let's talk about gay marriage and hate speech. Where to begin? I mean, you, can, you probably every person in this room can think of five separate stories, right? How about, you familiar with the name Brendan Eich? Firefox, one of the founders of Mozilla, the inventor, creator of JavaScript, without which I would bet probably none of your computers or smartphones would be working today. In, on March 24th of last year, Brendan Eich was promoted by the board to CEO of Mozilla. Less than two weeks later, he resigned. Why? In 2008, when California went to the polls, they had a proposition to vote on. Proposition 8. Proposition 8 stated that only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. That ballot referendum was approved by a 52 to 47 percent margin. Brendan Eich, who was worth millions, gave a thousand dollars to the pro Prop 8 side. As soon as he was elevated to CEO, the homosexual activist lobby came out of the woodwork and started attacking him on Twitter, Facebook, and in other social media, demanding 
Not that he be reassigned to another position within Mozilla, which is what the board wanted to do. They demanded his resignation, and he capitulated. April 3rd, 2014, he resigned. He resigned from all activity of Mozilla. Okay? He had never publicly made a statement against homosexuality, homosexual marriage, or showed any kind of discriminatory activity against either. He had quietly, privately written a $1,000 check to a political cause that he supported based upon his personal beliefs. Okay? Just. In 2000, by the way, a similar law was passed in California, a similar referendum. This one passed by a 61 to 39 percent margin. Okay. That 2000 law was struck down by the California Supreme Court. The 2008 law was struck down by a federal court. <coughs> so, I had to be silenced. He had to be destroyed. No matter his contribution to society, you know, through his creation of JavaScript or Firefox, he violated the tenets of the left. What about Christian bakers, photographers, pizza makers? You're all familiar with the case, I'm sure, of the bakers in Oregon, okay, the photographer in Colorado, uh, the pizza makers in Indiana. There was also a baker, I believe it was, in Arizona. Okay. Yes, question? Are you going to say anything about the Chick-fil-A? I wasn't, but I can. <laughs> you mean because of Dave Cathy's support? Dan Cathy. Dan Cathy's support of the 2008 law? Yeah. And how, you know, essentially the left tried to destroy Chick-fil-A and what but what happened in that case because that's it's different people rallied around them. yeah don't mess with my chicken business. the conservatives said don't mess with my food and what did they do I mean they gave Chick-fil-A its most profitable year ever if I remember correctly yes but are you going to talk about the the woman at the checkout no they're at okay no. Uh, okay uh, Dan Caffey he did not say I hate gays or anything. No, he I said, I believe in biblical marriage. Yep. That's all he said. And fast forward, the guy the guy that drove all the protest is a is a guy that's been married to another guy for eighteen years. He reached out to that gentleman. You're familiar with this? Yeah, he, I think he, I am. He, but reached go ahead. Out, he reached out to this gentleman, started contacting him, invited him to the Chick-fil-A bowl had him up in the suite, had him on the sidelines, and this guy wrote an article in the Huffington Post apologizing for everything he had done and said anybody that ever attacks Chick-fil-A on this subject, they will have to take me on. Did you ever hear that in the press? No. no. Now Dan, uh, during that time, Dan Kathy and I talked two or three times a week. Okay, and he would say, I need to do this. And uh, because Chick-fil-A had been involved in several things I do all over the country. But anyway, he, it, it was the type of thing where, yes, it got the big press when he, when he said, I believe in biblical marriage. But when the guy wrote the article, says, these are some of the sweetest people, nicest people I've ever met in my life. I will never condemn them for anything. Never heard a word about it. Well, Dan Cathy did what I'm going to suggest okay. at the very end. What should be the Christian response to all this? All right. So, what about the, as I said, the Christian bakers, photog photographers? Let me make one more comment about Chick-fil-A sure. because actually that did involve the First Amendment. Because in Chicago, the mayor of Chicago made public statements. You're right. Yeah. And so does and so the local order. Chicago values. I suppose the Chicago values are killing each other all the time yeah. in the street, but leave that aside. 
Uh, so did the mayor of Boston. Exactly. So the First Amendment was impacted in that. Now they backed down. Yeah. I guess they finally got some good legal advice oh, yeah. on that. But you're right. We're at, we're at a breaking point on this sort of thing. So what did these bakers, photographers, etc. do? They refused to participate in homosexual weddings because of their religious beliefs. Okay? You know, the, the, the family who ran the Memories Pizza Place in Indiana, they never refused service to anybody. The bakers in Oregon never refused service to someone. What they refused to do was to bake a cake for a wedding that celebrated okay, a gay marriage. Because they saw the, the two things that they did. If, if two gays came into the store and wanted to buy a cake, they would serve them. But it was taking their time and talent to do something to celebrate is where they drew the line. And because of their refusals, they've lost businesses. The Oregon couple was fined by a judge over $100,000. dollars one hundred fifty, I think it was. They've been personally threatened. They've had their reputations destroyed. Why? Because they're traditional Christians, pure and simple. And they believe that homosexu homosexuality is a sin, and that marriage is only between one man, one woman. But those beliefs no longer have any place in the public square. According to the left, one must leave one's Christianity at the threshold of one's home. It has no place in public, in business, nor in government, broadly construed. Schools. One does not have the right to, quote, this is my term, spew homophobic hatred in the public sphere. And if one disagrees with the homosexual agenda because of religious beliefs, one is automatically homophobic and afraid of gays and lesbians. Talk about a change in language. <laughs> yeah. Moreover, one may also not spew racist, sexist, or Islamophobic hatred in the public sphere. Islamophobic, the fear of Islam. How many people do you know that fear Islam? All right. The only people, I think, who are Islamophobic are those who so fear Islam that they will do nothing that may even slightly offend any adherent of Islam. Note well what I just said. Those who fear Islam are those who will do nothing that may even slightly offend any adherent of Islam. That is, if something may be, if something said may be construed as derogatory of Islam in any way, then the true Islamophobes will say nothing instead. They'll keep silent. And this idea extends all the way to proclaiming and defending even the Constitution. When Pamela Geller organized the Drama Muhammad contest in Garland, Texas earlier this spring, she says the purpose was to defend and pro promote the First Amendment protection for the freedom of speech and the press. Her American Freedom Defense Initiative is designed to promote and defend the freedoms enshrined in the United States Constitution. One may not agree entirely with her methods or even some of her rhetoric, but her stated goals are well within the norm and in the past would have been viewed without any alarm. But we don't live in the past. Because the past ended when? 9 11 01. Yes. But even, even so, here. Thank you. But even so, the, the whole cartoon event that Geller put together, uh, here in this discussion group, we're a bunch of Christian people, and the, the freedoms to speak are basically a means to an end, right? A, free, a freedom so that we can flourish as human beings that we can achieve our ultimate end, the ultimate good, which is God. In an event like that, I, I hardly see how that could be construed as consistent with that end. Um, as an example of Christian charity, loving God, loving neighbor, it was more of an example of, let's poke the bear and see if the bear acts like a bear. Was it? I don't see it that way. Thank you. I see it as, it, was it provocative? Yes. What was it provocative of? Do we, or do we not, have freedom of speech? 
Does the Constitution protect speech? Okay. What was the purpose of the context? She says it was not, okay, and it, again, she says, it was not to insult Islam. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind, how can one insult this? How can one insult Islam? Draw a picture of Muhammad. Tell them the truth about their religion. Okay. But that wasn't what they were doing. Okay. What they were, what, what, stop. It, it was what they were doing. Okay, they were, what did the contest do? The contest was designed to elicit the best Muhammad cartoon that would illustrate freedom of speech. Okay? That was the goal, it said. But the whole exercise was to do something which is inherently offensive to a Muslim. In inherently and explicitly. So it's not like it's a surprise to anybody. And again, it, understanding that this particular freedom, while we all embrace it and want to defend it, it, it is a means to an end. It's not an absolute freedom or an absolute right. That is one of our several freedoms, which is, should be in service of a greater good, which is to ultimately love God and love neighbor. Okay, but the Constitution says nothing about that. That was going to be my point. The First Amendment doesn't say anything about Christian love. Exactly. It says free speech. And that's what... She, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I would do that as a Christian, but... but and from the Constitution's point of view, exactly, it, it gives them the right to do it, or did give them the right to do it, it seems to me. And uh, the right of free speech guaranteed in the Constitution is, is not uh, without limits. No, it's not. Well, then there are limits. It's not an absolute freedom. You sure. Can't, you what can't, are you, well, you can't slander. You can't yell fire in a movie theater. Right. Uh, slander is probably the one that would appropriate here, I suppose. But you can, apparently, the Supreme Court just ruled, you can post quote-unquote song lyrics and statements on Facebook talking about how you're going to murder your wife. And it is protected speech. Well, it is until, it is until death do you part. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the, the Supreme Court protections for speech that are threatening now, because of this Elonis case, have been narrowed even more so that it... Someone right in your face exactly. saying the fighting words. This is not, I'm going to do Muhammad cartoons. Those are not fighting words. Legal precedent is clear. But Chris Cuomo of MSNBC explained after the Garland event, you know, the First Amendment does protect speech, but not hateful speech. This is a guy who graduated from Princeton. That's exactly what it does. Exactly, exactly. And that's what the First Amendment, or that's what Madison and the others were talking about. Okay? In doing my research, you know, George Will has a column where he says, the First Amendment is entirely, entirely about political speech. It's not about Larry Flint and Hustler. <coughs> Even though the Supreme Court has said it is. Okay? Yes. You know, and if we're going to defend the freedom of speech, then as Christians, we, we have, not silently, we've made our protests known, but when Piss Christ came out, we defended the right to do that, although we found it very offensive. When people dress up as pregnant nuns on Halloween, we find it offensive, but we are willing to let those people do it because it is a freedom we enjoy. And now we're changing all the rules. Exactly. Exactly. So, I'm almost done, so just a couple more pages. I'd just like to make one distinction here. What the, what the First Amendment actually does is prevent state action. And the greatest censorship, the greatest bar to free speech, is social action. And there's a very great difference there that has to be observed. What, what the First Amendment does is only put limits on state action. It does not put limits on social action. Social exactly. action used to be, you call my wife a bad name, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Exactly. And no, and no court in the, in the country would convict you. Well, sure they would. Now. <laughs> I just want to reiterate one thing you said about the focus of this seems to be political speech. 
as an attorney, I find this shocking and just totally against what this country is all about. And when I saw the extreme hatred that was envisioned by our political class, in particular, and their minions throughout the media, at the Citizens United case, which oh, was yeah. all about political free speech. I realize this is not the country at all that I grew up in. Well, and, and you're no doubt aware of Hillary's recent comment. And Any, for those it, that don't it, know, Citizens United, this is not Apple or Pepsi or somebody talking and, and making advertisements. This was a, an ad hoc citizens group, which the, the, the title Citizens United suggests it is. They produced a film on their own. They got together, formed an association, produced an anti-Hillary Clinton movie, and they were sanctioned by the federal government for this as violating federal campaign finance laws. Federal election laws, yeah. And the Supreme Court, to their credit, said the First Amendment is about political speech and nothing else. And Hillary Clinton... And I cannot believe the way that people who I respect otherwise think, oh, this is all about big money and politics. No, it's exactly the opposite. And the line reads directly from there to what the IRS did exactly. against the Tea Party-inspired groups. This is all a campaign of the federal government to silence the ordinary people. And, and Hillary Clinton, I think it was just last week, said if she's elected president she has a lit she she's has ready. a litmus test for any Supreme Court candidate that they will overturn Six. Citizens United. Wow. Okay. Keep in mind Citizens United was a film about her. So the Supreme Court will become what? Did didn't she make a recent comment that Hitler made? Some it was something to the effect uh the, the, the good of the whole, uh, or the individual good. has to succumb to the good of the whole. Well, I'm yeah, not I mean, quoting that exactly right, but it's something exactly what. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's where she said that people with deeply held religious beliefs or deeply held cultural values will have to change when it comes to abortion. Yeah, and probably gay marriage at the same time. Let me, I'm almost done. Can, can, I, make, can I make one real quick sure. comment? I would, I would uh, responding to him, I would say that Christian love and charity does not preclude provoking uh, people who are enemies of the gospel. You see, and, and to his comment earlier about satire, you see satire in scripture all over the place. You see the, the prophets in Israel uh, mocking the false prophet. You see Jesus Christ calling his interlocutors brood of vipers. And so there's an appropriate place in, in the Christian sphere to mock the enemies of the gospel. I'm not saying that's a, what, we were, what she was doing necessarily in that cartoon campaign. I'm just simply saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss out of hand the, the, the provocation of the enemies of the gospel through satire. And think for just a moment, you know, with the Muhammad, the drawing Muhammad contest, what the, if you've seen it, what the winning cartoon was. It, it's not anything with, you know, as there have been others, of Muhammad having sex with a pig or a five-year-old girl or something like that. It's a picture of this guy's version of Muhammad saying, you cannot draw me. And these hands saying, and that's why I do. Okay. Unfortunately, and if you don't know, they put up 100 billboards of that. Yesterday yeah, in, in St. Louis. Louis. Unfortunately, as Kirsten Powers argues, the devastating effect in her new book, *The Silencing*, which, if you've not read it, I, I will be the first person to say, go out and spend the 15 bucks to get it. Kirsten Powers is a liberal columnist. She is a voice for liberalism in, on Fox News, which I don't. I haven't watched Fox News in 10 years. Okay, but. She's one of the, what I will call, good liberals. How? She's honest. She's honest. She's willing to debate. She's willing to entertain ideas that are opposed to her own and to debate them. Her entire book is about those of her friends on her side of the aisle who don't want to debate, they don't want to discuss, all they want to do is silence and shut up. Those with whom they disagree. Okay? 
She points out, this is the scariest thing, and Mark, you're probably familiar with this. There are many First Amendment scholars, lawyers, professors today who are arguing that the First Amendment needs to be amended to remove protections for hate speech. In other words, so that the First Amendment cannot be used as a defense. They want to specifically exclude hate speech from First Amendment protections. But who's hate speech? That's the problem. That's the rub. Who's going to decide? Again, 535 members of Congress? God, no. A bunch of lawyers in robes at the Supreme Court? No. We've already seen what happens when a state passes not one, but two state right referenda. They get overturned. By who? A small group of men and women in black robes. So, what's the Christian to do in this environment? <laughs> I was rewriting this this afternoon. I thought, you know, I had to throw in something. Oh, well, okay, what's the, what's the um, logical thing to, to say here? Okay, you know, vote, be active in politics, write letters to the editor, blah, blah, blah. That's all fine and good. But I think it's pretty simple if we're going to truly be Christians. To truly be a Christian means to follow Christ in all things take up our cross to expect persecution and to never return evil for evil. So what does that mean? We speak in truth and love the truth and the love to those with whom we disagree. We must hate the sin but not the sinner. As Christ repeatedly said, he came to serve the sick, not the healthy. What does that mean? We must see each other as sick and broken and in need of healing. That is, we can't, we can't approach those with whom we disagree from a standpoint of superiority, I think. We can't say, my opinion. My way or the highway. We must see each other as broken and in need of healing. And there's only one source for that healing. And that takes me to the talk I would have originally given tonight. The church. Moreover, we must take up our crosses. That means, at least to some extent, not getting into arguments for argument's sake. Just to win a point is not, my opinion, the Christian way. We never see Christ, for example, in the gospel. Get into an argument just to score a point for God. Just to take Satan, you know, down a peg. What's the purpose in that? Where's the love? Where's the humility in that? Yes, we vote. Yes, we engage. But remember, we remember that in all our interactions with others, and especially with those who use those buzzwords that I don't know about you, but when they're used at me, and I'm a university professor, you can, so you can imagine I've heard them before, they press the button. When those who label us racist, homophobic, sexist, okay, I'll, I'll give them that one. I am a sexist. <laughs> Islamophobic, whatever a phobic, we must always deny ourselves, our egos, our need to be right or victorious, 
and we must place that other person's well-being. To get back to your point, their ultimate purpose before ourselves. We must see, as C.S. Lewis said, that we are interacting with people who one day will be gods or goddesses that if we saw them now, we would fall down before them and worship them. We must see, in other words, or we cannot convince others of the truth of Christ if they don't see or experience Christ in us. What else? We got to expect persecution. What did Christ say? Blessed are you when you're persecuted. And when men revile you and persecute you for my sake. Joy. Okay. Christ told us that we must expect the world to hate us. Why? Because it hated him. What did it do to him? He hung on the cross. I really hate to say this because I'm putting this on my YouTube channel. <laughs> what does that mean? That should mean for us. It means we need to give them a reason to hate us. It means if we are going along with everything in our society, if we don't have any persecution, any suffering, any sorrow, because of our Christianity, we may, may need to take a look in the mirror. He told us it will treat us as it did him. Crosses anyone? We must also be despised and rejected of men. But like Christ, we must nevertheless love them. Even if necessary, unto death. And if necessary, if it demands our death, if it takes our death, what do we do? How do we respond? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Ethiopian martyrs of last January, one of them was on the tape as he was getting his neck slipped, saying, forgive them. Greater love hath no man. Also, we must never, ever return evil for evil. Christ said, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. He, he wasn't just giving Sunday school lessons. The least of these is whom? It's every person we come into contact with. It's not just our minister. It's not just our deacon our priest, our quote-unquote super spiritual friend. It's every person. It's Christ, 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 Christ. As St. Patrick says, Christ before me, Christ beside me, beside, behind me, Christ beside me to the left, Christ beside me to the right, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ everywhere, in every person. He or she is Christ to us. How can we comport ourselves to him or her, or how we comport ourselves to him or her, is how we comport ourselves to Christ. Reread the parable of the Last Judgment, which personally I find the most frightening passage of all of the Scripture. Because how do I know I'm not going to be on the left hand? Finally, we must pray. We must pray for ourselves that God will forgive us our trespasses. For others, as we forgive those who for trespass against us. And for the world, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Ultimately, all our prayers must be subsumed under those four words. Thy will be done. Once we accept that all things come from God. All things come from God. And it may take a lifetime to do so, to reach that acceptance. I'm not there yet. When, quote-unquote, bad things happen to me, I wrestle with them. 
I'm not content in all things as St. Paul said we were to be. But once we do reach that point, then we will truly see that all things do come from God, who makes the sun and the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust alike, and who loves all men and desires that none come to perdition. Thank you.